ESCOM countries freely and your right to move your money and your business. This is the basis of the CARICOM Single Market and Economy, CSME, and the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, and an appellate jurisdiction to hear appeals from courts of those countries which decide to use it as their final court of appeal and no longer go to the Privy Council. All CARICOM member states who have signed the agreement establishing the CCJ are members of the CCJ. In studio discussions, insight, Creole news, road to the throne, Calypso, Creole festival, carnival, and lots more local programming. See it all on the Government Information Service, your first for local news. Today's Dominican economy, having been made safe by this government, has boosted the confidence of the local private sector. This is evidence of the government's ability to create the type of economic environment conducive to such investments. Evidence of this government's concern for the private sector and local investment. In other parts of Dominica, the increase in new hotel plants and other areas of investment is testimony to the government making financing and concessions affordable and available, thus boosting investor confidence. Once again, this is evidence of the government's concern for the private sector and local investment. These investments have created employment through manual labor, procurement of material and use of heavy equipment and how could we forget the employment through provision of services once again this is further evidence of the government's concern for the private sector and for local investment now take a look these are all locally owned and that's what this government has done to improve and increase confidence in the private sector and boost economic growth. This is further evidence of this government's concern for the private sector and for local investors and local investment. I am Rosman Libre. Shelter manager for the Lubia community. Persons are advised that when they come to the shelter, that they first and foremost they bring their valuable, like their gold, silver, like their items. In studio discussions, insight, Creole news, road to the throne, Calypso. Creole Festival, Carnival, and lots more local programming. See it all on the Government Information Service, your first for local news. Did you know the Caribbean Court of Justice is two courts in one? The CCJ has two functions, an original jurisdiction, which deals with your right to move between CARICOM countries freely and your right to move your money and your business. This is the basis of the CARICOM Single Market and Economy, CSME, and the revised Treaty of Chagaramas, and an appellate jurisdiction to hear appeals from courts of those countries which decide to use it as their final court of appeal and no longer go to the Privy Council. All CARICOM member states who have signed the agreement establishing the CCJ are members of the CCJ. You asked for it, 
see more evidence of development right here on the Government Information Dominica's indigenous people reside on a 37,000 acre reserve in the east of the island. The Kalinagos, as they are usually referred to, are friendly people gifted in craft production skills and farming. One of the concerns over the years, however, was the poor housing conditions of its people. From the time I raised up, yeah, I raised up. we knew nothing about houses and so on. We are the Arupas, covered with yatao leaves, not coconut because coconut was not common. Lawrence Daru, a former parliamentary representative for the Kalinago territory in the late 1970s, remembers well the words of the late Edward Oliver Leblanc as he spoke with residents of the territory back then. I can remember the words he told us that when we the Caribs will vote for he or any member of his party to represent we the Caribs, that's the time the Cab Reserve will start to develop little by little. The words of the former Premier has indeed borne fruit. You've received more from the government in the last 10 years than all the years since you gained our independence put together. The Roosevelt Skerritt administration has made significant progress in improving living conditions within the territory. In the last nine years, we have built in excess. 87 new homes and not even and put in one and created more space so that the boys and girls could be in separate rooms in any kind of territory. Improving housing conditions is a costly exercise, but with assistance, there is an increasing number of calendar people who are sleeping better at night. Kalinagos like Nizanda Lucien. I live right by the river, but I, was, I couldn't sleep in night when you see rain falling. I couldn't have a resting sleep because I tread the river, making so noisy, the river going so strong, and you have a, the, a little soup upon me again. I, I that doesn't make me good. Here, I am comfortable, I am happy all the days of my life. Honorable Ashton Grano is the parliamentary representative for the Kalinago Territory. He feels proud to be part of an administration that has made so much progress in addressing the housing needs of his constituents. I know growing up as a little boy, I've, I've never seen in my entire life and in the history of the Kalinago people uh, 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 an injection of massive um, funds into the, the improvement of the living conditions of the Kalinago people. Significant amount of financial resources have been injected into the constituency to build new and repair as well as possible the views of the people of La Plaine, Poetica and Dailies. I'd like to start with a quotation, Madam Speaker, from the Right Honorable Justice Byron in a symposium entitled The Role of Spirituality in the Judiciary and Legal System just a week ago well, a week and a half ago, 20th of June, in Trinidad. And he had this to say. At this time, and I quote, our focus should include connecting faith with the realities around us. 
if we are to effect change through transformation of the human heart. Unless we take strong steps to combat the present situation in favor of justice, the prevailing unjust order will be strengthened and perpetuated. That was the Right Honorable Justice Byron. I'd like to suggest that the realities around us, my, Madam Speaker, our people, what they face on a day-to-day -day when they consider the question of the CCJ, they would say no. Madam Speaker, I would suggest also that there's little, if no connection of faith has been attempted by this government since they had the opportunity, and I note that it was in 2012 at an OECS meeting of heads, the 54th meeting, that Dominica and St. Kitts were the only ones who could take steps to accede to uh, the CCJ, um, no longer having to go as an OECS. So we've had time to uh, connect faith to the realities that we are facing. So Madam Speaker, change is left for someone else. The chance of this government to ensure that there was change has passed. This, however, I would like to say is a strong step, or appears to be a very strong step regionally, progressively, and historically for justice. But all the local steps, all the local actions, Madam Speaker, over the last number of years have been weak, have been ineffective. And even if this is a strong regional step, a historical step, it is clear that the local reality suggests that perhaps the time is not right. Some have even said that this is more like a smoke screen, hiding the reality that we face on a day-to-day -day level. And they have called it a rush to judgment. My view is that I'm in full support of the institution, the idea, Madam Speaker. But I raise the question, have all the issues been addressed? And the Honorable Minister, in his opening remarks, said that he felt that they were addressed. And perhaps the issue of independence and how appointments are made have been addressed. And I trust the former Attorney General of Antigua, whose government has been so prominent in showing us the road to how to conduct free and fair elections. I trust him when he says that he believes that there is independence at the level of the CCJ. But Madam Speaker, the issues have not all been addressed or very weakly addressed by the so-called consultations that, that they claim have taken place. And I believe on top of that, we have a local experience of how the Electoral Commission and the Integrity in Public Office Commission have been treated, and that clearly sends a message to our people. In addition and on top of all of that, we have how our local courts have acted, and the question of the quality of justice has clearly been raised. So clearly our people do not feel that all the issues have been addressed and the opportunity has not been seized. Let me once again go to Honorable, Right Honorable Byron in another quotation, this time in a separate um, symposium, this one on criminal reform at UWE, St. Augustine, Trinidad and Tobago. And the title of this particular set, uh, paper that he presented was Reengineering the Criminal Justice System, and I quote, a high responsibility is placed on our leaders to set the right example. We need to actively recognize and address the high levels of corruption in our region. We need to take steps to restore public confidence in governance and administration at all levels. After all, a law-abiding citizen is the product of a law-abiding society. And we would do well to remember that the converse is also true. Again, the Right Honorable Justice Byron. 
We have shown bad example here in Dominica. Corruption is rife. Restoration so badly needed has not been sought, Madam Speaker. And the converse that the Right Honorable Byron ended his quotation, his, this particular quote with, perhaps is true here, our criminal leadership is creating criminal society. Madam Speaker, I am very depressed about this so-called public awareness. This attempt or opportunity for people education that was not seized. The building of understanding. Matter of fact, in Trinidad and Tobago, where we have the host organization that hosts the CCJ, they have not yet acceded to the CCJ. They're taking their time. They say they want to ensure full awareness of their people and they're prepared to go through an education program that is comprehensive and also have a, ref a referendum. I dare say if we were to conduct a referendum here today, it would reflect the fact that the so-called public education program was extremely poor, extremely weak, and we would get a no. Madam Speaker, the OECS is also an area that we have been engaged in quite prominently. A prominent organization, perhaps even more prominent than the larger organization, CARICOM. And questions have been raised, why should we go it alone? Some of that has been explained. I would have thought it is ideal to go, to go together. Why are we in Dominica going alone? But it, did, it was explained that there were certain legal complications, Madam Speaker, in that regard. Madam Speaker, I once again want to go back to the Right Honorable Byron because I thought that he has so much to say that was relevant in the context of this particular discussion. And this quotation comes from the same spirituality and judiciary uh, symposium I referred to on the 20th of June uh, at, uh, in Trinidad. And I quote, every generation faces the challenge of identifying which principles will ultimately lead to better relationships within society and among neighbors and reject those that will divide us as a human family. Madam Speaker, I think we have not seized the opportunity the Dominica Labour Party has not seized the opportunity to reject the, act, to reject the actions that they could have taken and they have resulted and those opportunities that have not been seized have allowed us to be very seriously divided, Madam Speaker. But a historian friend of mine warned me that to say we are not ready is a condemnation of our independence. 1978. I respect him. I respect his studies, his research, and his perspective. So I won't say it. In fact, I will say we are ready in a broad historical sense. We have shown as a people our resilience, our tenacity, our brain power, our independence, our Christian faith. We have shown, Madam Speaker, our self-confidence and our sense of identity, Madam Speaker. We are ready for our own court. And the quotation, our people, our region, our court, is an apt quotation. But, Madam Speaker, but this Skerritt-led Dominica Labour Party has demonstrated over and over again its great unreadiness locally in the institutions that are so important to justice in our country for this court. Yes, you are not ready. The people of Dominica would be ready if you had done the better job of the education program. But you are not ready and you have demonstrated that, Madam Speaker. The Prime Minister, in his remarks, said, I am excited. I am excited about this thing that we are passing here today, that will be passed, I'm sure. But he went on to say, but I am sad. You should be sad. You should be sad about the unemployment and the lack of jobs in the country. You should be deeply sad about the demise of agriculture. 
we should be deeply sad about the levels of corruption that have arose over the last 14 years. We should also be sad about the condition and the lack of independence of our key institutions like the Electoral Commission and the Integrity in Public Office. You have not given the Integrity in Public Office Commission teeth. You should be sad about the rise of crime, brothers and sisters. And you should be sad that you allowed Antigua to take the lead in showing how to do free and fair elections in the Caribbean. So to say you have led in all things, I think, is a great contradiction. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I lend my support to this very important and indeed historic and momentous occasion. The Honourable Member for Margot used that word earlier on. I think he was echoing my words and I'm glad that he echoes the words that I utter. Um, Madam Speaker, just to continue the theme of, of quoting the Right Honourable Sir Dennis Byron, Many may, may, may recall that Sir Dennis was in Dominica last year and presented at a forum, which I believe was under the auspices of the Dominica Association of Industry and Commerce. And I also believe that that particular occasion was carried live on air, the national radio station is my recollection. That, Madam Speaker, was part of the general effort to inform the populace of Dominica of the CCJ, what it is, how it works, and how it can and will assist us. The member from Maragot says that he wasn't there. I suspect that means that he wasn't there, because I certainly was there. Well, very well. <laughs> I, ma Madam Speaker, I, this, I think, is, is important in the context of this very important um, bill before the House. And since we are quoting Sir Dennis Byron, I, perhaps we should quote him where he is directly relevant uh, to the matter that we are discussing here today. Under the heading Access to Justice, page 5 of the document that I have, the presentation document, reads as follows. If I may, Madam Speaker, with your leave, read on occasion. This is one such occasion. In the countries in which the CCJ is already the final court, it has been actively facilitating access to justice for the ordinary person. It has been facilitating access to justice for the ordinary person. Much of what I've heard this morning seems in one way or another to suggest that that is not likely to be the case. So then this goes on, Madam Speaker, to say this. There is now tremendous relief for litigants in terms of expense and in the complexity of lodging and appeal. Increasing numbers of people from all walks of life are able to obtain quality justice at the highest level. An interesting illustration is the case of Ross and Sinclair from Guyana where the CCJ granted an elderly woman leave to appeal as a poor person. The CCJ further facilitated access to justice by conducting the hearings via audio and video conferencing, which spread party, sorry, which spared the parties the burden of travel to Trinidad. Madam Speaker, Sir Dennis Byron is highlighting a clear instance where the Caribbean Court of Justice has brought justice closer to the people. This lady would never have had an opportunity of bringing her matter to a final court of appeal and have, having it heard because she just would not have been able to travel to London to the Privy Council. But here, not only did the, the Caribbean Court of Justice facilitate, grant her leave to bring a petition, but they traveled and facilitated her presentation of her matter before that august body. Madam Speaker, if I may, on page 7, under the heading, The Independence of the Judges of the CCJ. In some quarters, including some who have uh, addressed this House today, it seems almost fashionable to suspect that po politicians exercise control and authority 
over the judges and influence their decision making in given cases. However, we should encourage an awareness of the CCJ's institutional arrangement as it would become clear that these safeguards completely shield the court and the judges from any political interference. So Dennis Byron continues our belief, the CCJ is fully independent in the best of tradition. The judges are appointed after a competitive selection process that is free from political control and interference. In fact, the British Academy funded a research project in 2008 which found that the selection process of the judges of the CCJ should be used as an international model for identifying judicial candidates. Madam Speaker, if that is not a ringing endorsement of the Caribbean Court of Justice, which, uh, and its president, who the member, the senator from Lap Lane just so readily praised, I don't know what is. Madam Speaker, if I can turn perhaps to um, continuing education, if I might put it that way, of the issue that we discussed. The bill that's before us, Madam Speaker, has a long title, and the long title goes as follows. An act to amend the constitution of the Commonwealth of Dominica to facilitate the establishment of the Caribbean Court of Justice as the final court of appeal in Dominica and to provide for related matters. The Constitution of Dominica Amendment Act 2014. Now, Madam Speaker, that is clearly what this bill that we debate today is for, to amend uh, the Constitution to provide uh, for Dominica to delink from the Privy Council and accede to the appellate jurisdiction of the Car Caribbean Court of Justice. So how does that fit with some of the, um, I guess I will call them criticisms that have been uh, uttered uh, this morning from the opposition bench? One of them was that apparently uh, there is a complaint that there has not been any or there has not been any sufficient consultation. I don't have a comment. Well, Madam Speaker, if I may cite the words of a former Attorney General during a previous debate on this matter uh, in, on the 23rd of September 2004, which was referred to, I believe, by one of the members on the opposite benches earlier on. The former Attorney General, during his uh, presentation in, in the debate, stated as follows. A lot has been said about consultation. The idea of the Caribbean Court of Justice is not a yesterday matter. It is not a yesterday matter. Madam Speaker, that is very true. The Caribbean Court of Justice is a concept and a notion and idea that has been around for a long time. And indeed, a little later in my presentation, I will uh, touch on the historic journey uh, that has brought us here. It is something that has been discussed for many years in this region. Obviously, at various times, the intensity of the discussion and the debate has been greater than at other times. But Madam Speaker, to say that there's been no consultation, to say that somehow there's a deficiency in the process that we are embarked upon, to say that somehow we should wait until every single individual puts his or hand up and says, I understand fully everything about the Caribbean Court of Justice, every nuance, every turn I understand. Madam Speaker, is a complete and utter joke. This joke there has been extensive consultation on this matter, Madam Speaker. I, myself, as Attorney General, along with the Minister of Legal Affairs, traveled, as I've indicated previously, the length and breadth of Dominica discussing the issue of the Caribbean Court of Justice and answering questions of everybody who chose, and I double underline the word chose, to attend. What else is she She is the only one, uh, I, I, I don't know, maybe I should, I should amend, I, I see the, the, the other member from Marigot, his head suddenly uh, shifted when I said that, because he of course attended the Marigot, the, the Marigot session. Uh, hence, hence, hence. <laughs> and indeed, Madam Speaker, he, uh, he actually asked questions. At, at, at the forum. Perhaps if more, um, more of those, either from the opposition benches or those who have concerns or claim to have concerns, had chosen to attend these fora, they would have had a clearer understanding of what it is the Caribbean Court of Justice is about and how it can benefit them.
It is also interesting, Madam Speaker, that while members of the opposition have continued to utter, some might say in parrot fashion, a, a claim that there has not been adequate, if any, consultation, I have not heard a single indication of what it is that would have constituted sufficient consultation. Is it five weeks of consultation? Is it six weeks? Is it three hour meetings? Is it half hour meetings every other hour? What is it? No, but none of them have said what it is yes, sir. that would have consulted this consultation that they tell us there has been what done. Is it? What is it? In addition, Madam Speaker, it is absolutely abysmal for an opposition to come to this or any party, complain that there has not been consultation, and be unable to present a single instance where, where they the opposition who claim they're so concerned about the populist understanding the Caribbean politics have attempted to inform the public about it. I happen to have been around long enough to remember Dame Eugenia Charles and remember Dominica moving into independence. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the Honorable Member, the, the Senator from, from La Plaine will, will also recall that particular time. And I will also recall, Madam Speaker, that during that period, there was dissent as to whether or not we should, in fact, move into independence at that time. The Freedom Party, under the leadership of Damien Jean Charles, was not in government. They were in opposition. What did they do? They traveled the length and breadth of Dominica, preaching their gospel to the population of Dominica, putting their side to the population of Dominica. It is my understanding that uh, Dr. Leonard Sonnychurch was part of that entourage. But Madam Speaker, the point that I make is this, to reinforce that I just made. The opposition have a duty and an obligation, not just to muddy the water. Madam, Madam Speaker, if I may move to the second issue of the criticisms that I wish to address, and I, 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 I have to do so because the judi judiciary are not here and are not able to defend themselves. Madam Speaker, it is utterly despicable that members of this House should stand in this House using the cloak of this House to attack the judiciary in the way that some members have done today. In the way that some members have done today. Madam Speaker, the court has a function to carry out. To say because we do not get the results that we want, that the court is somehow dishonest or even Quick minute. He's making it very hard for the, 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 the stenotypist to heal. Um, perhaps the cell phone can be removed from where it is. It's still on. Madam Speaker, as I was saying in relation to the, the second issue of attack, it is, it is, it is not acceptable for, for us, it is, let me make the distinction, it is of obviously acceptable for each and every one of us to pass comment on the judgments of the court, um, that is not something that we are not entitled to do, but it is not acceptable for us to, in the absence of justification or evidence, accuse the court, however we seek to disguise it, of dishonest behavior and practices. As I heard one member on the opposite bench, bench is doing earlier on, to say that in one case, the, the courts accepted certain documents, and in another, another case, they didn't accept the documents, suggesting that the, that the courts were behaving in a wholly uh, inappropriate, and in fact, unlawful manner. Uh, Madam Speaker, we need, particularly those of us who are in this house, uh, to engage in robust, discussion, debate, possibly even argument, if that's a, a term one chooses to use. But Madam Speaker, we need to recognize that we have a responsibility. There are people, the same people that some of them speak of, out beyond the, this house, listening to what we say, looking at us and looking at our conduct. 
and to simply feel that there is some mileage to be gained from attacking everybody and every institution. The courts, the, 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 the religious leaders, the, 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 those who, who are at the head of, of, of any of the organizations that we have, is, Madam Speaker, not a way to go. It is particularly disingenuous to, to present these attacks on the judiciary as if they are somehow a, a attempts to, to protect the populace. Madam, Madam Speaker, despite uh, my, my friend from Marigot, the member from Marigot's attempts to uh, deflect me from my course, um, the, the, the Integrity in Public Office Act and the Integrity Commission will doubtless be discussed and debated at an appropriate time, and I will be happy to engage him at that time. But, but also, Madam Speaker, what is particularly um, disturbing is that the opposition, even today, had an opportunity to educate the public, use the medium of this House, this debate, which is being carried live, perhaps around the world, to use that opportunity to explain to people in clear terms what the CCJ is as they understand it, if it does not match up to the standards that they would, would, would wish, where it does not do so, and how it does not do so, and Madam Speaker, how adjustments could be made to allow that august body that they all claim that they actually support to function effectively for the use and benefit of all of us citizens of the regions. They, of the region. Madam Speaker, they have not done that. They have not even attempted to do that. They then move to claims that there, there is delay in the system, in the legal system, the justice system, which somehow justifies their position. Madam Speaker, and so far as I am aware, I, I, am, I am advised that much of the delay that has been, been incurred in cases that the members opposite have been involved in has been of their own making. And in particular, as petitioners in most of those matters, one would expect, and indeed the obligation is on the petitioner in any matter, to pursue it with vigor and expedition. It is not the person who you have taken to court who should be pushing your case for you. So, Madam Speaker, I really believe that uh, this, this claim of delay is, is really a smokescreen. Of course, anybody who has any association with the court will be aware that there is delay within the court system. But any person who has uh, any knowledge of the court system, or indeed any court system anywhere in the world, will know that court systems worldwide are afflicted by delay. It is almost uh, the nature of what you deal with. The question is not delay, it's whether there is undue delay. So the, the, member, the member for Salisbury may wish to make that, perhaps, that distinction, which I hope and trust is not too fine, between undue delay and simple delay. As I said quite clearly, there is delay in every court, in every jurisdiction worldwide. It is then claimed by the, the members of the opposition bench who have made contributions that somehow the government is rushing into this. Some say rushing headlong. As I've indicated, this is an issue accession to the Caribbean Court of Justice. That has been with us for many, many years. We've all known about it. Indeed, the member for Marigot has previously debated in this house on it, and perhaps not him alone, on the issue of the Caribbean Court of Justice. At uh, the same session that you referred to earlier, uh, and, and I, I, not me, <laughs> your friend, your friend now, he's now, he's now your friend. <laughs> the, the then age, you know your friend. <laughs> occasion, I've stated on a pre to this House on a previous occasion that the CCJ was a reality and the debate over the pros and cons 
a thing of the past. The time for cost-benefit argument is gone. Geography and history have made the Caribbean people one people. Well, I, I certainly agree, Madam Speaker, that geography and history have made the Caribbean people one people, and that is also a critical element of the whole concept of the Caribbean Court of Justice, bringing the Caribbean people together, further advancing the whole concept of integration. And in our, in our case, in Dominica's case, this step is just one further step on that journey. M Madam Speaker, the legal basis then, what is the legal basis for Dominica acceding to, or, or let me put it this way, coming to this house uh, and asking this house to pass the bill uh, before it um, so that Dominica can delink from the Privy Council and accede to the jurisdiction, the appellate jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice. Madam Speaker, that is to be found in Section 42 of the Constitution. Section 42 of the Constitution, Madam Speaker, is very clear in my respectful and humble submission. Madam Speaker, Section 42, subsection 1, provides for Parliament, this body, uh, to give it the general power to alter any provision of the Constitution. But the framers of the Constitution were wise men and women. So they didn't just leave it there and leave it for Parliament to have a complete free-for-all. I said framers, and I know that you're very good at English, so you will get the S on the end. What they did was they qualified some of the ways in which we could alter the Constitution. And so far as what we are seeking to do here today, Madam Speaker, I've broken it down into four steps, some may say two. And I say four steps to make it even clearer in my view. Essentially, the four steps are these. these. Firstly, there has to be a three quarters majority on the final reading, which is found at section 42.2 of the Constitution for those who wish to go and look it up. Secondly, only elected members of the House uh, have a vote on this issue. That's also at section 42.2. But what the Constitution provides is that if those two elements are not present, even if this House were to purport to pass the bill, the bill would not be regarded as passed. So in effect, it would be uh, effectively a non and void, null and void um, action. You then have two further steps, Madam Speaker. The third step is that there has to be a, a, an interval of at least 90 days between the first reading and the commencement of the beginning of proceedings in the House on the second reading. That is found, Madam Speaker, at subsection 3 of section 42. And Madam Speaker, the fourth substantive uh, element is that the bill must be approved on a referendum, and that is at 40, section 42.3b. But again, Madam Speaker, that is dealing with the general uh, alterations to the Constitution. But what the framers of the Constitution did is in relation to, to section 106 of the Constitution, which is what we are concerned with and what the uh, bill before us amends, which deals with the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. In respect to that, the framers of the Constitution provided that it was not necessary to have a referendum. And it provided at section 42, for A, that with the agreement of the United Kingdom, we, Dominica, can delink from the Privy Council and accede to the jurisdiction of the Caribbean Court of Justice. They didn't say that in those terms because it wasn't identified in that particular court, but gives us the liberty to do that and to choose that court. So, Madam Speaker, that is the legal basis for the decision and how we arrive where we are. Have we complied, Madam Speaker? Yes, we have. <coughs> One and two, I, I mean, the, 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 besides, this, despite the fact, despite the fact that um, that the honourable member for Marigat continued continuously makes that intervention, I didn't actually see that here. But we may be able to, uh, to assist um, if you if you wait just for just a second. The three quarters of majority and the elected membership, well, when we have the vote, Madam Speaker, we will see whether that has been uh, is satisfied. In respect to the 90-day interval, interval between the first and second readings, by my calculation, we're somewhere around 98 days. The sitting 
first of June having been on the 19th of March of this year. And in respect to the agreement, Madam Speaker, um, there uh, was correspondence between the government of Dominica and the United Kingdom authorities. And there is a, a, a particular uh, communication, um, Madam Speaker, from the Right Honorable Lord Newberger, President of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, which is addressed to the Honorable Ian C. A. Douglas, the Honorable Minister of Tourism and Legal Affairs, um, at the um, government headquarters address of that office. And dear Minister, uh, thank you for your letter of 26 March, giving me formal notice that the Commonwealth of Dominica has decided to delink from the Privy Council and accede to the Caribbean Court of Justice as your final court of appeal. Thank you also for your kind words about the work of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council that it has undertaken over the years. Whilst I and all the Supreme Court justices will be sorry to lose our contact with Dominica, we entirely understand the decision you have taken and the reasons for that decision. We, look at the, we, have, looked at the, sorry, we have looked at the proposals included in the draft bill and are content that the transitional arrangements proposed are both appropriate and manageable from our point, point of view. I am therefore happy to signify my formal concurrence. It would be helpful to know as soon as possible the operative date for the proposed changes. Madam Speaker, that is a communication um, dated the 30th of April of 2014 from the President of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, the Right Honourable Lord Newberger. So Madam Speaker, again, continuing the educational mode and just touching on briefly on the historical journey. Prior to, <laughs> prior to uh, our accession, uh, or prior to the concept of the, of the Privy Council, of the Caribbean Court of Justice, sorry, Madam Speaker. Um, you have, have four minutes left. Thank you. We have, yeah. Madam Speaker. I move that the Honorable Attorney General be given an additional 10 minutes to complete his contribution to the bill. Seconded, Madam Speaker. It has been moved and seconded that the Honorable Attorney General be given a further 10 minutes to complete his contribution. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Please continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in the historical context, we had the, the Privy Council, which was established uh, a number of, of years ago, um, and certainly the records show that as long as 1640, it was a, a, a body that was uh, known of, and indeed it lost some of its judicial authority in, in that year. Um, subsequently, in the 1800s, 1833 to be precise, um, it secured, by way of legislation passed in the UK, uh, its current judicial status, if I can put it that way. Madam Speaker, we have had the uh, Privy Council serving us um, from really those times. But it's important to note, Madam Speaker, that the uh, Privy Council has not always been, um, I was going to say man, but I, I, we have ladies in the day, but it has not always been um, presided over by, judge, by judges who have legal training. Now, of course, that is the case, but in the past that has not always been so. So, Madam Speaker, we come to the current time, and we come to the Caribbean Court of Justice, and, and those listening to me would have heard me say that um, there has been discussion about a Caribbean appellate court of final jurisdiction for many years. And indeed, Madam Speaker, the records indicate that as long ago as the 6th of March of 1901, the Jama Jamaica Daily Gleaner, in its editorial, indicated that it was time for the Caribbean to have a court of its own. It indicated that Certainly irritating, but okay. Ma okay. Madam Speaker, okay. Madam Speaker, perhaps I should should read it. I think it's it's sufficiently um, interesting um, that it may be useful to read that small passage if I can find it. I, I can't leave my own hand on it. Just 
found it. Right, Madam Speaker, it, it, it states that it, in, in effect, in, on the 6th of March of, of um, 1901, the editor in the Gleaner indicated that the Privy Council was out of joint. That's the phrase it used with the conditions of the times. It is one of the arguments that has been marshaled in support of uh, the current day generation moving from the Privy Council to the Caribbean Court of Justice, which has more relevance to us, uh, which understands all particular circumstances and situations. I've said on, in other fora that um, anybody who has any awareness of the British system, and in particular the British uh, class system and the British judicial system as it relates to the populace, will be aware that to a large extent the judiciary is considered to be unrepresentative of the general population. Indeed, most of the judiciary, even today, have been to Oxbridge and, uh, and basically um, private education, and certainly have no correlationship to those from the inner city areas of the United Kingdom. So it is, seems to me highly unlikely that they could be closely aligned so as to understand in very clear terms the nuances of our circumstance in, in Dominica, um, in areas that we may refer to as ghetto areas. <coughs> Madam Speaker, 1947, which is closer to our time, the me a meeting of the West Indian governors um, in Barbados urged that there be a West Indian final court. And then the more recent genesis of this development was in the 1970s. On the 6th of July, uh, in July of 1970, a meeting of CARICOM heads of government in Jamaica um, determined that the attorneys general of the various jurisdictions should meet and should work toward establishing a court of final appeal for the, for the region. There were two meetings thereafter, one in August uh, in, in, in Barbados and a subsequent meeting in March of 1971 in Guyana. Sadly, we did not get then uh, the actual uh, forward movement, but we subsequently ended up there in 2001. So Madam Speaker, what are the concerns? The con concerns that I have identified as I have traveled around and as I've spoken to people are largely, Madam Speaker, a claim that there's a lack of independence uh, of the judiciary. I read the words of Sir Dennis Byron uh, a little earlier. I don't need, know that I need to add too much. Perhaps what I would add is just simply this in terms of the mechanism. Unlike, as, a, as has been indicated previously, many other jurisdictions, indeed most other jurisdictions, where judges are appointed either by the Prime Minister, President, or some other such individual. With the Caribbean Court of Justice, judges are appointed by the Regional Judicial and Legal Services Commission, which is an entirely independent body, uh, independent of political appointment or, or interference. At the current time, there are 11 members of, of that body. Um, the, again, I think it's important that those listening who, who may not be as familiar as some in this house are aware of the composition of, of that body. And that body is provided for at Article 5.1 of the agreement establishing the Caribbean Court of Justice. The body, 11 people are one, the President of the, of the Caribbean Court of Justice, who shall be the Chairman of the Commission, two persons nominated jointly by the Organization of Commonwealth Caribbean Bar Association, the OCBA, and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS Bar Association, one chairman of the Judicial Services Commission of a contracting party selected in rotation in the English alphabetical order for a period of three years. Four, or I should say D, the chairman of a public service commission of a contracting party selected in rotation in reverse order, English alphabetical order, for a period of three years. E, two persons from civil society nominated jointly by the Secretary General of the Commons Community and the Director General of the OECS for a period of three years following consultations with the regional non-governmental organizations, NGOs. And finally, at F, two distinguished jurists nominated jointly by the Dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of West Indies, the Deans of the Faculties of Law of any of the contracting parties, and the Chairman of the Council of Legal Education. And finally, finally, G, two persons nominated jointly by the Bar or Law Association of the Contracting Parties. 
Those are the 11 people, and Madam Speaker, it should be clear to anybody listening to me that they are not in the pockets of any particular politician or even general politician, insofar as I'm aware. The other buttressing um, part of the mechanism is the trust fund, Madam Speaker, which is set up under the revised agreement establishing Caribbean Court of Justice trust fund. And that body, Madam Speaker, uh, is again um, composed of independent people. And Madam Speaker, Article 6 of that um, agreement provides as follows, composition of the Board of Trustees. The Secretary General of the uh, CARICOM, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, the President of the Insurance Association of the Caribbean, the Chairman of the Association of Indigenous Banks of the Caribbean, the President of the Caribbean Institute of Chartered Accountants, the President of the Organization of Commonwealth Caribbean Bar Association, the Chairman of the Conference of Heads of the Judiciary of Member States of the Caribbean Community, the President of the Caribbean Association of Industry and Commerce, and the President of the Caribbean Congress of Labor. Madam Speaker, trustees, again, who I would submit are not in the pockets of politicians and are well capable of making independent decisions. Madam Speaker, in terms of the financial sustainability, which is another concern, that same trust fund, Madam Speaker, is come to us as a uh, 100 million US dollars was invested in that fund to provide for the uh, provision of the court in perpetuity, meaning, Madam Speaker, without an end of time. And I am, I am, I am given to understand that the cost of running the court is somewhere of the order of 5 million US dollars a year, and that the income generated by the fund can well manage that amount so as to cover the full cost of the court the purpose of the trust fund and the rationale behind it, uh, quite an ingenious uh, mechanism, Madam Speaker, is to insulate the court from the politician. So the court does not need to go to the Honorable Prime Minister of Dominica or to the Honorable Prime Minister of Grenada or Trinidad or anybody asking for money to run the court. That money comes from that trust fund. And Madam Speaker, each of the, na the, the member states or the contracting parties has had to contribute one of some to that um, fund. In Dominica's case, I think it was in the, of the order of 2.2 million, which is consistent with the amount that each of the uh, OECS countries uh, had to contribute to that fund. Uh, Trinidad, Guyana, Barbados, and Belize paid uh, into that fund higher sums um, than we did. And if I missed out Jamaica, Jamaica, of course, also had to pay a higher sum. So, Madam Speaker, uh, those are some of the, the, issue, the, the concerns and how they are addressed. The issue of, of so-called partiality of judges um, of, of local courts, Madam Speaker, I do not think, based on the sums, and I'm sure the Minister of Finance doesn't think, based on the sums that the Treasury has had to pay out in recent times to litigants who have uh, proceeded to take the government to court and have successfully um, litigated their matters and received awards, in some cases exceeding $1 million, I don't think that that is an indication or supports the theory that the courts in Dominica and in our region do not provide justice for the ordinary man and woman on the street. As regards the so-called insufficiently qualified jurists, which one or two people um, seem to indicate, Madam Speaker, I don't know that I should say too much about that. Quite clearly, we have sufficient, um, well-qualified and eminent jurists in the region to deal with the issues of concern that we have. Madam Speaker, in short, um, as I come to close. <coughs> the Trinidad and Tobago Constitutional Commission in its report of 1974 um, indicated, which is otherwise known as the Wooding Commission, indicated that the propositions which were put forward in favor of the retention of the Privy Council reflected timorousness and a sense of insecurity. I have not heard uh, and, and certainly uh, an express support for retention of the Privy Council in this House today, thankfully. But I have heard indications outside. Um, I would say that I haven't heard a wholehearted support of or accession to the Caribbean Court of Ju Justice. But Madam Speaker, we need to have the self-confidence as a people and a region to step up. Uh, we, the situation is analogous to that of a, a, a young adult uh, who has come to an age of, uh, in their parents' home where they now need to make their own decisions, they need to make their own way. We need to step out boldly and with confidence into the big wide world and take responsibility for our own affairs, and in particular, take responsibility for our affairs in the
insofar as they are concerned legally. Madam Speaker, in conclusion, if, if I might be permitted uh, to do so and to borrow from uh, the, an editorial, the editorial of the Barbados Advocate on 6th of September 1971, where, where it's stated among us as follows. In the final result, it is not the traditions of an institution that make it what it is at any particular time, but rather the qualities of those who man that institution. It will be left to the judges who will be called upon to give service, not to allow themselves to be influenced by the several devious ways that could be tried. There is no greater trust placed in human hands than that which allows a man or a body of men to sit in judgment over other men. Madam Speaker, it is up to those who man the court, those who had the responsibility to design the concept, to provide for mechanisms, to provide for the insulation of the court, have done all they can. They have even tried to ensure that only the best are selected to sit as judges. It is now, Madam Speaker, obviously, over to the judges to sit in judgment in that court and provide the level of service that we as Caribbean people desire. Madam Speaker, I am satisfied that the government and people of the Caribbean, through CARICOM, have taken all reasonable steps at this time to ensure that the Caribbean Court of Justice is established and maintained as a credible, efficient, and effective final appellate court presided over by judges of high caliber, intellectual acumen, and integrity, willing and able to, de to deliver justice to the peoples of the Caribbean, and more particularly, Madam Speaker, Dominica that the mechanisms, the checks and balances entrenched for the securing of the financing, independence, operation, and general functioning of the court are among, if not, the most robust to be found anywhere in the world today. Madam Speaker, I unreservedly support this bill. Madam Speaker, and in conclusion, let me thank all those who have contributed to the debates on what we consider today to be a very historic bill. I believe that all of the uh, reservations have been uh, clarified, particularly um, by those who spoke on the government side, Madam Speaker, and I don't think that there is anything else that I can add to the debate that was not covered in terms of the um, security of tenure for the judges, the arrangements that have been made for the funding of the court in perpetuity, take it away from any perceived um, political interference. I mean, the range of matters, Madam Speaker, that have come up not only in this House, but throughout uh, the debate, um, the public debate and the public uh, education process throughout the years, Madam Speaker, have been covered. And I, I, don't, I want to thank my colleagues. I want to thank the Attorney General and um, those uh, state attorneys in the Attorney General's chambers for assisting the process from the very, very beginning, the, the members of the private bar um, in Dominica, and also those who have come from further afield. In fact, the, the Chief Justice Dennis Byron came down and he gave a, um, a very elucidating lecture on the matter that was carried repeatedly by GIS uh, and, and gave every single Dominican an opportunity to understand the workings of the court. Just recently, Madam Speaker, we had another lecture again, Madam Speaker, by another legal luminary um, from the Caribbean region, Madam Speaker, from some of the Caribbean soil. And so I, I'm very happy at this point that we are in fact taking this historic step towards establishing towards establishing the Caribbean Court of Justice as our final Court of Appeal. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled the Constitution of Dominica Amendment 2014 be read a second time. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Constitution of Dominica, Amendment Act 2014.
The bill has been read a second time and will now stand committed to a committee of the whole house to be considered clause by clause.
House resume, and I have to report that the bill shortly entitled the Constitution of Dominica Amendment Act of 2014 passed the committee stage with a few amendments. The question is that the report of the committee on the bill be adopted. Those in favor? Those against? The ayes have it. Madam Speaker, I believe we um, ask for a, a division, Madam Speaker. I, I would ima imagine yeah. you do it at the last, or at the last. Okay. Well, we can do it now and at the last, whatever yeah. you wish. Yeah. I okay, see. Madam Speaker, very well. I shall yield to, I shall yield to you. We'll do it at the end. Okay. Okay, so you go ahead then. So you want the division now? This this particular measure requires a division. Right now. Yes, okay, Madam. rather than at the third reading. Yes, yes. Okay, fair enough. Yes. So um we are going to have a division for purposes of satisfying the um That's, that's what's the proper name, though. Okay. It's, it's, it's just the, uh, the, the clerk is going to just tally and, and, and see how many voted and so on. So please go ahead, Mrs. Jules. Well, this is it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with us doing it at both stages, you know. I the final reading. Final reading, okay. So... Can AG proceed then with the... Madam Speaker, I move that the bill shortly entitled Constitution of Dominica Amendment Act 2014 be read at this time. Can we have a seconder? Second. It has been moved and seconded that the bill shortly entitled the Constitution of Dominica Amendment Act of 2014 be read a third time and passed. Those in favor? Those against, okay, the eyes have it. So now. Constitution of Dominica, Amendment Act 2014. Now we, we can have the division. Go ahead and do the division. Yes. Yes. The Honorable Minister for Lands, Housing, Settlements and Water Resource Management. The Honorable Minister for Education and Human Resource Development. Yes. The Honorable Minister for Agriculture and Forestry. Yes. The Honorable Minister for Caribbean Affairs. Yes. The Honorable Minister for Health. Yes. The Honorable Member for the Colonial Constituency. Yes. The Honorable Minister for Public Works, Energy and Sport. Yes. The Honorable Minister for Employment, Trade, Industry and Diaspora Affairs. The Honorable Minister for Social Services, Community Development and Gender Affairs. Yes. The Honorable Minister for Information, Telecommunication and Constituency Empowerment. Yes. The Honorable Minister for Culture, Youth and Sport. Yes. The Honorable Minister 
for environment, natural resource, physical planning and fisheries? Yes. The Honorable Parliamentary Representative in the Ministry of Public Works, Energy and Ports? Yes. The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Lands, Housing, Settlements and Water Resource Management? Yes. The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for information technology? Yes. The Honorable Member for the Superior Constituency? The Honorable Member for the Salisbury Constituency and Leader of the Opposition? Abstain. Member for the Marigold Constituency? Absent. The Honorable Member for the Roto Central Constituency? Come, come, Mrs. Mrs. Jules. and one abstention and two, two abstentions. I shall repeat it for the record. The clerk has recorded 18 eyes, one abstention and two absents. Okay, now Um, um, okay, now, just one moment, please. Can, can, can we just have some, can we just have, um, will, will the leader of the opposition please be quiet? Speak for yourself. I will deal with him after. Oh, oh my goodness. Come on, can we have some... Please. Okay, now. I will now say, because the bill was read by the clerk, the bill has been read a third time and passed accordingly. And the rec let the record show that there were 18 eyes, one abstention, and two absentees. Uh, the AG will, will, will tell us that um, whether we have um, met with the requirements of the necessary. Madam Speaker, I reiterate what I said during my contribution. Uh, and with the vote that, we have, that has now uh, been passed, uh, by my calculation, 16 would have been the, the three quarters. And we have 18, so in terms of the um, two, uh, three quarters majority, that is established, and that was established by way of only those who are elected members of the House. So those two elements have been satisfied. We've also satisfied the element of uh, obtaining or having the agreement of the United Kingdom uh, for us going forward. And so, Madam Speaker, uh, and obviously we have a 90-day period between the first reading and the second reading. Madam Speaker, all of the requirements of the Constitution have been complied with, and the uh, bill is now in a form that it can be sent to President. I, shall, I am informing the House that I shall prepare this certificate accordingly, which I shall send to His Excellency along with the, the, the letter which you have spoken of. Um, that being the, the case, we have exhausted our order paper. Is <laughs> that right? What's that? Which vote? <laughs> well, what?
Madam Speaker, I move that the House be adjourned. Sign and I. Seconded, Madam Speaker. It has been moved and seconded that this honorable house be adjourned. Sine die. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. This honorable house stands adjourned. Sine die. Speaker.